3D printing is a, I guess, if you if you want to call it a revolution, we, we've said many people have said it is the, the revolution of the digital age. It is a new way of making products. And who is it a revolution to? I think it is a revolution to, to manufacturing companies, people who make products, traditionally make products. But it is also a revolution to the consumer. So traditionally, if I am involved in manufacturing, I, I must consider the investments that I must make, and I must make tooling. Many things are made in China because it is cheaper. Um, well, this technology allows me to think differently about where I make my products and how I make my products. But also, if I'm at home, maybe I want to make things at home. That's a revolution to me. I don't have to go to the shop. Maybe I can print things in my own, uh, in my own house. So I think that is what makes this a revolutionary technology. What, ki what kind of objects can I uh, uh, develop in my own home? Okay, at the moment there are a small number of products. Companies are only very, very recently designing products to be made in the home. So at the moment it is very much focused around toys and games and, and very simple products. But we're seeing more, um, more complicated electronics products, uh, housings that go around electronics products. And we're also seeing kits being sold. So if you imagine um, um, remote control helicopters and remote control cars, we, we still need to buy the electronics but a lot of the plastic components we can print in the home. So those are the sorts of things that people are printing in the home. But in industry, we are printing many, many types of products from plastic components through to metal parts used in surgery, implants used in healthcare, hearing aids, components for aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in the future, uh, we will buy only the, the file to be printed? <laughs> I think we'll, we will see a very different economy. Yes, we will buy data in the same way that we buy music today uh, and we buy films. You know, we used to buy CDs and we used to buy DVDs and now we buy data. And there is a move towards this within the 3D world that we will buy data files and print them out ourselves. But this won't be for everything. There will always be mass-produced components and mass-produced products. Um, but, but yes, there is an emerging economy of creating digital data and making it available on the internet for people to either share with one another or for people to sell to one another. So it is a new economy. Basically, it's a 3D printer where as many parts as possible are printed by the machine. The, the first one that we made, um, obviously we had to buy the parts from someone else because it's a bit chicken and egg. If you don't have a printer, how do you make the parts for a printer? Um, so we actually got those off eBay. Uh, a couple of years ago and since then we've made several machines by printing the parts off um, on the one we've made um, and putting together and we, we've got a, a whole family tree now we've got um, parents and grandparents and uh, siblings and um, yeah there's two main plastics that RepRap uses one is ABS um, which is the stuff that Lego is made out of um, it comes is a kind of petrochemical um, plastic and the other one that we use is PLA which is polylactic acid so it's a um, cornstarch based it's, it's really amazing and the, the enthusiasm is kind of infectious you, you, you print something and immediately you're thinking how can I improve it how I, or even as you're building the machine how can I make this part a bit better so it's, it's very engaging It's like um, I would love to remember before we had um, really colour photocopying or um, uh, certainly you didn't have a printer in your own home and uh, it, it transformed everybody's workflow because you could just print stuff out straight away. I think this is going to do exactly the same thing. Possibly you won't have one in every home but you, you'll have like you used to have um, colour photocopiers on those street corners. You'll have 3D printers or possibly the colour photoshops will start stocking 3D printers and you'll just go to the same place and just get 3D things. So at one level I think the, uh, the electronics world is going to see a big shift 
and the ability to make custom devices easily, cost effectively, uh, satisfies a need for individuality that the, the previous century of you can have it any colour as long as it's black to paraphrase Hen um, Henry, T for Henry Ford and his Model T, um, I, I, I think that demand is there and it can be realised by people making um, their own devices, their own objects etc. Um, and I see some similarities uh, now between the early days of the internet and the early days of 3D printing. Um, you know, the sort of revolutionary impacts that could have on uh, the way people regard manufacturing. Uh, and I think it's, you know, 20 years time we could be looking back and thinking, wow, it's a bit different now to the way it was 20 years ago. A few months ago, I just bought a 3D printer for just 1,000 US dollars. I used it to print a missing Lego block. In fact, people now start to believe they can print anything anywhere and not just toys. In the last five years, 3D printing has got enormous media attention. The statistics showing that in the past 10 years, there's an increase in worldwide revenue in billion dollars from 3D printing industry. You can see obvious upward trend after 2009. In Asia, Japan and China are two key players, followed by Korea and Taiwan. One popular principle in 3D printing is complex is free. In manufacturing, the more, co more complicated the shape, the more it costs to make. But on a 3D printer, making a decorative ball will require no more cost, time, and skill than making a simple ball. For example, shape complexity. For a manufacturer, making a Low bearing structure, they usually start from geometric shape and study dense. When nature does the same, it optimizes the design using complex free form and cellular material such as bones. 3D printing makes shapes that until now were only possible in nature. The other is uh, material complexity. I think some of you may find it difficult to buy in shoes that are truly comfortable. It's partly due to the uneven pressure when you contact shoe sole. Recent research provides a solution for you to print the shoe sole with customized material mixture distribution that will lead to uniform pressure on the shoe sole. Functional complexity. Uh, for better heat transfer and cooling, this particular automobile component have two channels on the top merged inside with the channel to the side. This one piece is very light in weight and also multifunctional. It's almost impossible to make by traditional manufacturing until now. The other is customized products. 3D printing provides customization for medical implants, jewelry, and even clothing. It's revolutionizing prosthetics and allowing you to make limbs in much cheaper and faster scale. It's not just make specialized prosthetics, but a much more fashionable one. All we presented so far is just tip of the iceberg. The iceberg underwater may include many new business, new products that are still beyond our imagination, such as direct print of food, electronics, and human organs. Many details are still omitted, but the future holds infinite possibility. This 3D printing iceberg may impact on all aspects of product life cycle, from design manufacturing all the way to logistics. It will impact on existing industry and may generate totally new business. <coughs> they definitely cause some concern on all these areas. Let's start from manufacturing. Will 3D printing end made in China era? It's a specific manufacturing model rely on mass production, cheap labor, and global distribution. One possible scenario may be like this. 
a consumer will order a design anywhere in the world online. Print out a receipt, walk to a local 3D printer, printing shop, and pick up the fresh made order. We're still far from that scenario, yet it helped to unlock the design capability of this region. HKUSD now have collaboration with China Canadian Arts on developing a course bring together art and technology, and 3D printing will be the key. One day, made in China may be replaced by design in China. Logistics is one pillar industry in Hong Kong. If 3D printing ends made in China, maybe also means demise of logistics. It will not make economic sense to ship the raw material all the way to China through Hong Kong, assemble into final product, and ship back to US. On the contrary, logistics industry responds quite positively to 3D printing. Amazon eBay has taken initiative to integrate 3D printing into their business. Just this July, Amazon launched a specific website to sell customized 3D printed products. UPS also launched a 3D printing service in San Diego, and more to come. One area that may be overlooked is quality control. Even industrial 3D printer usually cannot guarantee quality over a prolonged production cycle. Not to mention the personal 3D printer. Statistic quality control techniques cannot apply directly. Because such a small lab production does not have repeated measure of the same kind. A few months ago, I bought a 3D printer. I imagined I would print anything. I print the, the Lego block. But I tell you, it didn't fit. Because the dimensional quality is still not comparable. HKUSD and USC now have joint research on 3D printing quality control. And we believe quality will be the enabler of digital field manufacturing era. Thank you. Last week, Public Knowledge hosted its second 3D DC event on Capitol Hill. More than 500 people RSVP'd, and more than 20 representatives from the 3D printing community came to show what their printers, scanners, and research was all about. Objects ranging from vases to recreations of ancient sculptures were exhibited, showing people in attendance that the future of 3D printing is now, and it relies on people's ability to think outside the box. Two of the people taking 3D printing to new heights are Jordan Miller and Dan Chen from the University of Pennsylvania. Dan explains that they're printing 3D filaments out of sugar to house blood vessels to build human tissue. We'll take our cells and we'll form them around this, this structure which we printed. And so then we'll dissolve away the sugar structure and we'll look at this hollow um, tube uh, network. So then we can take this tube network and fuse blood through it. And so in this way we can keep large scale tissues alive. So all the cells within that tissue have the necessary nutrients and oxygen to survive through the blood flow that comes from this printed sugar network. Regardless of the event's title, not every exhibitor had a 3D printer. Some looked at 3D printing and sought ways to make it more practical. Uh, I'm Tyler McNanny from Vermont. Um, this is our product called Filibot. And Filibot makes filament for 3D printers. Um, you can put pellets in, you can put shopping bags, soda bottles, milk jugs, and create new filament. It also creates a closed loop recycling system where if you have a bad print, you can throw it back in the system, make new filament, and make a correct art. As the event wore on, it was clear that 3D printing was not only exciting to people who had never seen it but was sparking conversations with people that were familiar with the practicality of 3D printing already. Whether you were printing skin tissue or Legos, there was something in 3D printing for everyone, and that's why 3DC was such a great success. So, he's helping my son build one of his skin The genesis of the software was really when we started doing research looking at uh, head impacts and looking at uh, how the head responds to an impact either in a vehicular accident or when it's hit 
uh, with a projectile. And we started to look at uh, how we could use traditional physics-based simulation tools that were had successfully been used for many years in aerospace and automotive. But of course, to do that, we needed a model of the head. So we needed a computer model of the head. And traditional techniques had been based on models being based on drawings. In this case, of course, because it's a human body, there, the human head, there was no drawings. We needed some method of converting image data, MRI, CT data that you can capture uh, into the kinds of models that would uh, be suitable for physics-based simulations. In the early 2000s, then, we decided uh, very early on to spin out a company. During a number of years, from 2000 to approximately 2007, we really built up an arsenal of algorithms, techniques, and also, of course, computer code, um, because we need to embody it in some way that's saleable. Uh, so we had, a, a, by 2007, a pretty good software product. The whole process starts with um, scanning an object. Uh, that image would then be imported into the software, scan IP we sell, and it would be processed in such a way that we could reconstruct surfaces from it to break it up into these primitive uh, shapes, which are suitable then for uh, what are well-established uh, commercial physics-based simulation solvers. The software provides assistance at an early stage in the design process, in the research and design process, by enabling an understanding of um, both the mechanisms at work and how a product will perform or how it does perform in order to be able to change then, obviously, how it's designed to perform better. We were surprised to find that actually there was a very broad range of applications for the software across a number of different industries. Initially, the medical market was a large market for us, so things like implants, hip implants, but then it led on to products that interacted with the human body, so consumer products, shaving products, and more recently it's gone over to even more industrial applications, so the reverse engineering of engines, components. Uh, so the primary way in which it helps our customers or how customers can benefit is by simplifying and reducing the cost of trialing uh, hundreds and hundreds of different designs physically uh, by replacing this physical testing with an early virtual testing. We have 20 employees here, uh, many from a physics background, so the, the company is centered in Exeter and the development is done here so the, and the support. In addition, we have some uh, employees abroad uh, with an office being in the US we also are looking to expand and have an office in Germany as well. We've grown uh, approximately 600%, I think, since 2008. It's a sort of 40 or 50% per annum growth. And the growth has been also across totally new sectors. The Institute of Physics Award is really a recognition of, of the hard work we've done. And it's based on research we did early on uh, and managed to transfer from a university setting into a uh, company setting, into a viable and, 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 and thriving commercial entity. Uh, so we're very proud to have received the Institute of Physics Award. Laser scanning confocal microscope made great inroads into biomedical research. But in the mid-90s, a new technique called multi-photon microscopy promised great potential in terms of being able to image deep into live samples to look at new processes within biomedical imaging. The difficulty for the people using this technique was that it required a very complicated laser technology called a femtosecond laser, which up until then remained the preserve of the physics labs within universities and large research institutions. Femtosecond lasers require very complicated physics in terms of dispersion control, power control, 
and pulse width control. It required a physicist generally to be able to maintain the system and to be able to use the equipment required to diagnose and keep the system running. Here at Coherent Scotland we designed the Chameleon Laser to specifically address this problem. The Chameleon product line comprises three different TIE Sapphire lasers and a wavelength extension accessory. The idea of creating the Chameleon was to box this ultra-fast laser technology from a breadboard type solution which required continuous twirling of knobs and very complex equipment to monitor the, the status of the laser and put it in a black box where the biologist could literally turn a key and then set the wavelength that they desire for their imaging. This required a brand new level of automation which has not been seen in such complicated laser technology. There are a wide variety of biological problems which practitioners are using multi-photon microscopy and in fact using chameleon lasers. Imaging in the neurosciences where we can actually look at brain cell structure, we can look at neurons firing, we can observe learning processes. Being able to image deeper within specimens has enabled new techniques, particularly in applications like cancer research, where physicians can look deeper into tissue and observe drug uptakes. Also for tropical medicine, where we may be able to observe diseases like malaria and how they progress through the bloodstream. Coherent Scotland will still maintain a philosophy behind its business to take very complicated laser physics and physics-based problems and productise them in a certain way that puts it in the hands of users that can get the most benefit from the technology. Chameleons now can be found in everywhere from hospitals to universities to dedicated imaging core facilities within research centres all over the world, from US to the Far East, Australia, and we've even sent chameleons as far as Antarctica. The company has now grown to more than 100 employees. We do all the manufacturing here at Coherent Scotland. This is providing jobs, uh, both to Scotland and the UK, uh, and jobs for physicists as well, because the manufacture of these lasers inside is still a very complicated technology. The chameleon and other industrial products have driven growth into the tens of millions of pounds and this has further enabled larger and wider markets like the multi-photon microscopy. Without this type of laser technology, these industries would not have grown. Coherent Scotland is very proud to be, of course, the first Scottish winner of the Institute of Physics Innovation Award. It's a great accolade for all our employees here who have been working hard over the last 10 years to create our success. And from Coherent Inc's point of view, it certainly adds market goodwill and, of course, shareholder value. The accurate measurement of wind speeds is absolutely crucial for the wind industry. What Zephyr does is it, it's a, a wind lidar uh, that sits on the ground and measures the wind speed by emitting a laser beam out of the atmosphere and measuring a tiny fraction of the light that gets backscattered from dust particles in the air. It's being used very extensively in uh, the wind industry, in particular to assess the uh, potential of a possible wind farm site. It's being used to measure how windy the site is and see whether it will bring sufficient return on the investment and deliver the energy that's, that is necessary. The laser beam gets scattered back by random particles in the atmosphere and generates a uh, a speckle pattern back at the receiver in, in much the way that you, you can see when you illuminate a white board with a laser pointer. We can measure the Doppler shift 
which is a measure of the uh, speed of those particles, and use that to infer the wind speed at a whole range of heights. We've managed to develop Zephyr into a global brand. We sell more than 75% of our products overseas, from Africa to North and South America and Asia. For example, one area of potential growth is the mounting of LiDARs on the wind turbines themselves. By mounting a LiDAR on a turbine, you can get, a, if you like, a prior information of the wind uh, before it strikes the turbine. For example, if there's a, a large gust that could potentially damage the turbine, uh, then you could warn the turbine and it could feather its blades or pitch its blades. The offshore market is potentially very interesting because of the, the likely increase in this, in, the, in this activity in UK waters, for example. The wind resource is very good offshore, um, but it does bring problems. Traditionally, to, to actually assess the resource, the wind resource, and decide if it's a good site for a farm, you'd have to build a big platform sunk into the ocean, and this costs millions to tens of millions, depending on the water depth, and in fact becomes totally impractical in, in the deep water sites. So by using a remote sensor such as our Zephyr LiDAR instrument um, and mounting it on a floating platform, it gives you the opportunity to measure that resource at far smaller costs than it would using the alternative traditional methodologies. The understanding of physics has been absolutely crucial to the development of Zephyr. It uses so many different aspects of physics and that's what makes it a really interesting project uh, for me to work on. I think we could characterise Zephyr as being on the leading edge of what's available. Uh, it uses components, component subsystems from the uh, top producers from all over the world. Winning the Institute of Physics Innovation Award, I think it's a great accolade uh, for, for the company and for the team. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a feather in our cap. Uh, I think it's a, another endorsement of our ability to work in a very competitive environment. It's, it's very, um, very satisfying for one thing. I mean, we are all scientists and physicists at heart. So it's, it's just very nice to get that sort of level of recognition. It's extremely pleasing for me to see uh, the developments that started in a, in a lab with some Blue Skies research that went on to, to grow into a product that's now uh, shipped to customers all around the world. Thank you.